Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, if you're um, guests here to the Bloomberg School of Public Health, I'm Ellen McKenzie, and I'm the Dean of the School of Public Health. Um, thank you for joining us today, and I hope you're all doing well. Uh, we are, as far as my calculations, uh, put us about a little over halfway through the first term. And we are hearing from students and faculty alike that our virtual plus campus is really going quite well. Um, with all the online and virtual instruction this fall, our commitment to excellence and innovation and teaching and learning, as you know, has never been more important. So let me just take a moment to thank all of you who are contributing to our teaching mission, especially during these challenging times. You're doing a great job. And, and we hear over and over again from the students that they so very much appreciate all our efforts. I'd also like to just take a quick minute and give a shout out to Chris Byrer and colleagues for organizing a very powerful symposium yesterday in collaboration with colleagues at uh, University of Washington about the scientific integrity of COVID-19 vaccine efficacy trials. This symposium brought together uh, experts across government, academia, private industry, and philanthropy, including scientists who are directly involved in the development of COVID uh, vaccines, uh, all with a focus on the urgency of putting science ahead of politics. It received a lot of attention. I haven't gotten the final stats, um, but there were um, a, at least a couple of thousand people who tuned in. And it, it was really um, a great contribution, especially at this pivotal uh, moment in time. For those of you who are not able to attend in real time, um, it was recorded and the recording will be available shortly. Um, but uh, it's a, it was a great moment for the School of Public Health and the university. So I invite you to listen to the symposium when you get a chance. But we are here today to celebrate the work of one of our newly promoted professors, uh, Caleb Alexander. As you know, earning the rank of professor at the Bloomberg School represents an incredible achievement and confirms not only the respect and high regard of the school, but also of colleagues across the nation and throughout the world. And we are thrilled to have this opportunity to recognize uh, this achievement and to learn more about the work of one of our amazing faculty, Dr. Alexander. Caleb is a professor of epidemiology and medicine who joined the Bloomberg School in 2012 after more than a decade at the University of Chicago where he completed a Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Fellowship and then joined the faculty there within the Department of Medicine. In addition to currently, you can, you're gonna hear he's wearing very many hats and I hope he'll introduce us to some of those hats in his presentation. But in addition to currently serving as a primary care physician for about 300 patients, Caleb is a nationally renowned pharmacoepidemiologist and thus devotes most of his scholarship to studying the use, safety, and effectiveness of prescription medicines. Much of his recent work has focused on the epidemiology of opioid use in the US, as well as the effect of regulatory and payment policies on opioid prescribing, dispensing, and utilization. He has testified uh, regarding these matters in front of the U.S. House of Representatives, the Senate, and many other uh, governing bodies. However, as you'll hear um, about today, his work extends far beyond uh, the world um, of um, opioids and reflects unusual productivity and impact. The author of over 300 scientific articles, Caleb is a highly sought after speaker and lecturer. Here at the Bloomberg School, in addition to his other responsibilities, he serves as founding co-director of the Center for Drug Safety and Effectiveness and as principal investigator of the Johns Hopkins Center of Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation, an FDA-funded center to maximize the exchange of human capital between the uh, Food and Drug Administration and um, our university. Caleb received a BA cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania an MD from Case Western Reserve University, and a Master's of Science from the University of Chicago. So please join me in welcoming Professor Caleb Alexander. Caleb? Thank you so much, Ellen. It is such a privilege to uh, be here and to participate in this uh, lecture series. It really has been remarkable to uh, be able to try to weave a bit of a thread through uh, the past 15 or 20 years of, of my scholarship. And 
Uh, with that generous introduction, normally I like to quip that I just wish that my mother was in the room, but in fact, I think we are joined by my 91-year-old mother who joins us from Kennett Square, uh, Pennsylvania. So thank you again for this opportunity. I also would like to thank uh, Becky Newcomer, uh, who was really uh, so helpful in putting this talk together, and also recognize all of the remarkable faculty colleagues and trainees that constitute this incredible school. In 2012, when I was thinking about moving from the University of Chicago to Johns Hopkins, I called up Neil Poe, who was a faculty member here at Johns Hopkins at the time. And I'll never forget his, his simple, but I think profoundly accurate description of the institution. He described it as a vast sea of human capital. And it really has been remarkable to make this transition from Chicago to Baltimore and to have the opportunity to work in such an intellectually stimulating environment where team science is really the way that things are done. I'd like to just briefly acknowledge uh, many of my faculty collaborators uh, over the past several years here at this institution. And I, I apologize if I missed one or two, but these represent many of the individuals that I've had the fortune of working with. And I suppose if you're on, on the Zoom, I should also thank you for putting up with me over the years. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge trainees. For those of you that are joining the Zoom today that are master's students or doctoral students, postdoctoral fellows, uh, don't ever underestimate your importance to the institution and your professional potential and your capacity to change the world. It's really been a privilege to have you involved uh, in the training and in the work that I've done thus far having joined this institution. In thinking about uh, my professional career over the past uh, decade or, or 15 or 20 years, I, I felt like I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention my family. Of course, our professional lives are just one part of who we are, and my family really represents the center of it all. Uh, I have a wonderful father-in-law who likes to joke, reflecting on his own marriage, that he married up, and I think that's apt in my case as well. Uh, my wife, Martha Johnson, is a family physician. She works at Franklin Square Hospital in Northeast Baltimore, and also as an alum from the school, having gotten her master's here a few years ago. And we have three boys as well, Owen, Oliver, and Elliot. So, hi guys, glad you're joining. And this is the last slide of photos, I promise, but, but I couldn't resist the temptation. I suppose in the Zoom era, some of you are familiar with fun facts, where we uh, take turns saying something about ourselves that other people might not know, that, that, that might be surprising, that might be a little bit more exciting than that we're, you know, really gifted at, at uh, doing propensity score matching or bootstrap regressions. And in my case, I am an avid ornithologist. Uh, I gave up or sort of largely let the hobby go for about a decade and then earlier this year rediscovered, uh, rediscovered it and also got a nice camera lens. And so these pictures are just from the past few months. Uh, the top left is a Phoebe with a moth in its mouth. The top right is a gray cat bird eating a berry. Uh, the bottom right is a chestnut-sided warbler, for those of you interested in songbirds, and the bottom left is a pair of cedar waxwings. I, I like to wonder what the one bird is saying to the other, maybe complaining about politicization at the FDA or something like that. But on to the meat and potatoes of my talk, which is really about the field of pharmacoepidemiology. And as many of you may know, this is the use and safety and effectiveness of medicines in large populations or the study of such. And one of the cool things about the field is that it's really a bridge discipline. I often will tell trainees that might be particularly good in one area of pharmacoepidemiology, but not another, that everybody has something to bring to the picnic. And pharmacoepidemiology really builds heavily upon three different disciplines, clinical pharmacology, clinical medicine, and epidemiology alike. And the core of the field really rests upon a fundamental tension as well. And this runs throughout much of the work that we do. And it's the tension between the promise of therapeutics on the one hand and the real world realities of how they're used on the other. 
used well, medicines are some of the most useful and safe and cost-effective treatments in all of healthcare. I mean, consider treatments like insulin or penicillin or prednisone. I mean, these are transformative therapies that have the potential to change what were previously invariably fatal diseases into ones that can be lived with for, for years or for decades. So we have incredible potential with therapeutics, including recent innovations as well that I'll mention in a few slides. But, you know, I had a professor at the University of Chicago, a law professor that used to talk about the second best world that we live in. And I think uh, the, the field of therapeutics is as good a context in which to examine this as many others, because if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. And in the instance of therapeutics, we have all of this promise on the one hand, and then on the other, all of the problems. Drugs are prescribed when they shouldn't be. They're not prescribed when they're needed. Even when they are prescribed, many patients don't take them. Risks are often discovered only after drugs have been on the market for many, many years. Uh, many of you may know that at the time that of approval, products have been studied in only on average three to 5,000 people. Prescribers, and I'm one of them, often make poor decisions with respect to safety, effectiveness, and costs. And the effect of policies are all too often not assessed. So this then is the tension that runs throughout much of the work that we do in the field of pharmacoepidemiology. We're talking about big numbers here. I mean, these are not small numbers on the margin. If you look at the overuse of antibiotics, about half are deemed to have been unnecessary when reviewed by expert consensus panels. When we look at what's called primary non-adherence, the, the failure to take even or fill even the first prescription of medicine, up to 20 or 25% of medicines are never filled in the first place. And adherence to medicines for chronic conditions, even when they are filled initially, is often abysmally low. And then there's all of the adverse drug effects that can ensue, most of them preventable. I mean, consider, for example, more than a million emergency departments a year from adverse drug events. One of the things that drives these big numbers is just how common medication use is. I was tempted to try to do some live polling during this talk, but I'm enough of a Luddite that I knew better, so I don't have actual poll questions for you. But if you reflect upon your own potential medication use and that of your loved ones, I think you'll begin to appreciate just how common medication use is. Well, we've been interested in looking at this and performed several studies describing the prevalence of medication use among nationally representative samples. This was a study that was funded by the National Institutes of Aging and focused on the elderly, aged 62 to 87 years. And what was unique about this study, or one thing that was unique, was that we actually went to people's houses. You know, if you want to know what medicine someone is taking, a far better way than looking at EPIC records or looking at administrative claims from, from Truven is to actually go to their homes and ask them if you can see what they're taking. And looking just at the top right panel, the y-axis here represents prevalence from zero to 100%. And the, the, the x-axis represents men and women and overall in two different eras. So focusing just on the top right panel and the most recent era, a full 90% of elderly are taking one or more prescription medicine daily. And a third, a third of America, elderly Americans are taking five or more prescription medicines daily. And if this wasn't complicated enough, consider that it's not just prescription medicines, it's also over-the-counter medicines and dietary supplements. So these data, for example, suggest that 40% of elderly Americans in this nationally representative sample are taking at least one over-the-counter medicine regularly. And when it comes to dietary supplements, the numbers are even more stark, 60% taking one or more daily, 10% uh, uh, taking five or more dietary supplements daily. So this is a big deal. It's not just a big deal because it's a lot of medicines or a lot of money or a lot of potential adverse events from the individual medicines. It's also a big deal because drugs interact with each other. So one of the things that we did in this analysis was that we looked at the potential for major, not minor or moderate, but major drug-drug interactions. And the prevalence was 15%. 
In other words, one, uh, about one in eight elderly in the United States as of 2011 was was, were taking uh, two drugs at one time that posed a potential major drug-drug interaction. And what was more compelling still to us was that all too often this wasn't an interaction between prescription drug A and prescription drug B. It was an interaction between one prescription drug and an over-the-counter drug or a dietary supplement. So things like an interaction between lisinopril and potassium, or simvastatin and niacin, or clopidogrel, which is an antiplatelet that's prescription strength, and aspirin, another antiplatelet that's over the counter. So I think these data provide a bit of a cautionary tale and help to explain why we're talking about such large population impacts. So I'd like to go on and share with you a few basic principles from pharmacoepidemiology. The first may seem obvious when I say it, but you'd be amazed at how often, if you follow the literature, if you follow the scientific debates, if you follow how treatments are, are, are covered in the lay press, uh, how often even this basic fact gets glossed over, which is that drugs aren't inherently good or bad, any more so than a hammer or a roll of duct tape is good or bad. And I'd like to share with you a study that we performed. It was one of the first studies that I published as a senior author. And it was published in probably, uh, let's see, 2005. And we were interested in the COX-2 inhibitors, cyclooxygenase inhibitors. Anybody remember Vioxx or Rofococcib? And the important thing to know about these products is that they were never demonstrated to be more effective than their older and time-tested counterparts. NSAIDs, things like ibuprofen or naproxen, they were demonstrated to be selectively safer. And that's a very important concept. In other words, among individuals who are at a high risk for an adverse GI event, GI bleeding, the coccids were more safe than their counterparts. And what we showed in this analysis was that more than two thirds or about two thirds of the use of these medicines occurred among individuals that stood little to nothing to gain from them. Note the subtitle here of our paper, non-selective diffusion of a selectively cost-effective innovation. Drugs are not inherently good or bad. It depends on how we use them. Well, what happened with rofecoxib? So this is an editorial from Eric Topol that followed our paper by about 12 months. And he focused on extrapolating from clinical trials. Well, I should tell you, rofecoxib was pulled from the market. So that's what happened with rofecoxib. And by the way, I see question and answer, and I know we have a chat box, and please go at it. I mean, I, I'm sorry that I can't monitor it in, in real time, but nothing will make me happier than to see the chat box light up or to see the Q&A forum light up. So please, by all means, engage intellectually, pose questions. I don't even mind if you pose them to each other and answer them for me, because I certainly believe that all of us are smarter than any of us. The point here that Eric Topol makes in this editorial is that we're talking about potentially 160,000 uh, preventable heart attacks and strokes from this product that may have accrued. This helps to explain this real world impact of the non-selective use of medicines that may be selectively advantageous. The second basic concept from our field, it's not about risks or benefits. Here too, this may sound very simple, but it took me 10 or 15 years to appreciate this and really understand the power of this concept. All too often, we focus on risks or benefits without appreciating that the, the action is in the gray area, the action is in the balance between these for individual patients. And I'd like to share with you next uh, five questions. I'm in clinical practice. I actually saw patients this morning. And here are five, I've anonymized these cases. You can't re-identify these people. But here are five actual questions that I face in clinical practice or have faced in the past year. These are about risks and benefits, folks. This is not about only risks or only benefits. And for those of you that may be trialists or, or believe that, that clinical trials can provide the way out of the forest, I hate to disappoint you, but you will be waiting for a very long time. These are simply not questions which clinical trials are gonna to put to bed. Neither are many, many of the questions that I face in clinical practice. 
This doesn't mean the trials are unimportant, that trials don't have a role, that trials don't provide foundational evidence. Of course they do. But my point as you look through these questions is that no trial is gonna tell me the right answer to the clinical dilemma that I may face in these particular instances. So we have risks and we have benefits. And the third point I'd like to make about the field is that innovation is continuous. This is really cool and really makes our work of ever present importance. Think about the direct acting oral, uh, uh, the direct acting antivirals to treat hepatitis C. I mean, they totally revolutionized what used to be a, a, a disease that, that was people lived with chronically, they needed new livers, the treatments were neither terribly effective nor terribly safe, in which a, a, a disease that can be treated and cured in eight to 12 weeks of once or twice a day treatment, uh, just remarkable. Uh, interleukin inhibitors for the treatment of psoriasis, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, the chi CAR T treatments, chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. We are taking cells out of people's bodies. We're genetically modifying them. We're putting them back in the bodies and those cells through harnessing the body's own immune system are targeting cancers. So these are remarkable innovations and innovation is indeed continuous. I'd like to share with you just a few examples of, of how this has been so important. Here I've just depicted five different chronic diseases and examples of the drug classes used to treat these diseases over time. And so you'll see that, that over decades, the types of drugs and drug classes that we're using are often very different. Not always, but on average, there are clinically and policy important changes in how diseases are treated over time. Here's an example from our own work looking at type two diabetes. This is from nationally representative data of outpatient practice. Essentially, it's a nationally representative survey of outpatient practice. And the y-axis is treatment visits from zero to 80%. So this represents the percent of all type two diabetes treatment visits where one or more pharmacologic therapy was used. The x-axis you see is 1994 to 2007. Look at the incredible changes in the use of treatments over time. I mean, reductions in sulfonylurea use from 70% down to 40%. Uh, look at biguanides and glitazones. Uh, glitazones, by the way, put a pushpin in that one because we will come back to glitazones. But look at these increases over time and how diabetes is being managed. These types of changes, you will see disease by disease by disease, and they're truly important uh, in terms of understanding not only the drivers of these types of changes, but the real world impact of these types of changes, the comparative safety of different products, the comparative effectiveness of different products, uh, to say nothing about value, which I'll come to as well in a few minutes. This is a second example, the use of anticoagulants for the treatment of atrial fibrillation. And what's interesting here are the direct acting oral anticoagulants. So these hit the market in 2010 and they're depicted in orange. The y-axis here, by the way, these are the same type of nationally representative data. The y-axis here is office visits in thousands and it ranges from zero to 2000. So really it's zero to two million. And the x-axis is quarterly treatment visits from, uh, or quarterly visits you know, where an anticoagulant is used for atrial fibrillation, so treatment visits from 2009 to 2014. So you see that there is large uptake in the direct acting oral anticoagulants when they hit the market. Interestingly, there's reductions in warfarin, which was the older uh, alternative. And one of the promises of direct acting agents is that they're easier to dose. They don't require the blood draws every week or every other week. They, are, uh, they don't have as many drug-drug interactions. But another very interesting thing about this analysis is that we find that the overall treatment of atrial fibrillation increased over this time. There was great interest in whether this would be the case. And there was theoretical reason to believe that the advent of these newer and uh, in some ways safer and easier to dose anticoagulants would help close the, the, the treatment gap. In other words, it would decrease the under treatment of, of atrial fibrillation, this irregular heart rhythm that poses a risk of, of stroke. 
So these data alone can't answer that question, but they presented suggestive evidence that this may be occurring. I'm delighted to see there's chats going back and forth. I don't feel left out, so uh, keep, keep it up. And uh, by all means, if you see something that, uh, that you agree with or that you find offensive or outrageous or anything else, um, please uh, use the, the chat box or, or uh, the Q&A uh, forum to, to uh, take advantage of that. This just depicts the life cycle of therapeutics and pharmacoepidemiology has a, play, has a role to play throughout this life cycle. Of course, we can't use observational data to study a product that's not on the market yet, but nevertheless, observational studies of one product are nevertheless used to inform the process of drug discovery, preclinical studies, and clinical trials of other products. So there really is a role for pharmacoepidemiology throughout this product life cycle. There are many drivers of the life cycle, and this is a really fundamental concept of our field as well. I've talked a little bit about chemical and clinical innovation, but look at all of these other potential influencers that can change the ways that products are used. These are really important for our field. It's vital for pharmacoepidemiologists and other stakeholders to understand these and understand them well. Partly, we use these as we design research studies. In other words, in some cases, one needs to be cognizant of these, and they're built into statistical models. For example, we can control for some of these factors as we try to understand the association between, say, regulatory changes on the one hand and drug utilization on the other. But we can also use these to inform our study design so that we're less plagued by challenges of causal inference because of the, the ways that some of these sort of muck up the soup in terms of what influences prescription drug utilization. And these drivers are, of course, terribly important for other stakeholders as well, for regulators, for payers, for manufacturers and the like. Well, I've just mentioned some of the stakeholders, and this is part of what makes pharmacoepidemiology and pharmaceutical policy so interesting. Uh, the subtitle of my talk was about in search of mission control, and I'm going to come back to that. But before I do so, I'd like to just peel back layers of the onion a little bit and give you, I suppose, what I'll call a mouche bouche you know, like the uh, small teaspoon of something yummy that you get when you go into a fancy restaurant. Unfortunately, that's all that, that this talk allows for, but I want you to at least get a flavor of some of the ways that regulators and payers are fitting into the therapeutic landscape when it comes to how pharmaceuticals are being used and their ultimate public health safety and effectiveness. So this is uh, the, the Food and Drug Administration statutory language about what constitutes substantial evidence of effectiveness. And this is so important because the FDA, after all, are the gatekeepers. They serve as the regulators that allow products to market. And of course, after products are approved, they govern, they regulate the post-approval marketing and promotion of products. But despite the power of the FDA, there are a lot of misconceptions about what they do and do not do. For example, the FDA doesn't require that manufacturers compare product A with product B. The FDA doesn't require, and in fact, I'd argue that they're allergic to questions of value, cost, cost effectiveness, cost benefit, reimbursement, coverage. They don't have anything to do with it. And frankly, I don't think they want to. Uh, the FDA doesn't require that manufacturers exhaustively study all of the safety concerns that arise in the course of, 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 of drug testing and, and, and preparing a new drug application. And I told you that at the time that a drug is approved, it's only been studied among a few thousand people. So there's vast amounts of safety information that we have no idea of at the time a drug hits the market. And last but not least, the FDA does not closely regulate off-label prescribing. So off-label prescribing is something that we've examined, and this is the use of a medicine for a condition or uh, at a dose or among a population other than for which the product has been FDA approved. And it just so happens that it's terribly common. So in the best work that I'm aware of that examined this, the authors used nationally representative outpatient data and estimated that 20% 
one in five prescription drug uses in the ambulatory setting is off-label. Off-label use runs the gamut from evidence-based and guideline concordant to grossly negligent and everything in between. But what these authors found was that 75% of off-label uses, three and four, or about that, were, were, did not have strong scientific support. So you have a setting where you have huge volumes of medicines. I mean, tens of millions of prescriptions a year, if you figure that the overall market is in the billions, um, without, uh, that are being used without good scientific support and being used for off-label or non-FDA approved indications. Well, we could talk about how the FDA regulates this, and I do have a question for you on the next slide or two uh, about this matter. But first, let me say um, that we've looked at, at specific case studies or examples of off-label use. And this slide depicts an analysis here on the y-axis, again, nationally representative audit data. We have uses from zero to 18 million, and the x-axis is 1995 to 2008. And look at what, 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 what happens with atypical antipsychotics. Actually, similar to COX-2 inhibitors, they were never demonstrated, to my knowledge, uh, at the time of approval to have um, a huge uh, benefits in terms of uh, comparative effectiveness relative to their older typical counterparts. They too were brought to market largely on a premise of greater safety because they don't have the same what are called extra pyramidal side effects, essentially involuntary motor movements associated with them. But they do have other side effects. Setting that aside for a minute, look at this way that atypical antipsychotics first essentially largely replace the typical products. And then beginning in 2001, you have huge increases. Well, who's getting all these atypical antipsychotics? It turns out that one particular population that got an awful lot of them was the elderly with dementia. And many, many studies have demonstrated unequivocally that these products kill people. In other words, they increase the risk of mortality when used among the elderly with dementia by as much as 45 to 50%. Now, for those of you that are conceptually oriented, here's a graphic that explains or depicts a schemata that depicts how when we go from clinical trial scenario to on-label to off-label, we have a decrease on average in the benefit-risk balance. It's not always unfavorable off-label. I told you that some off-label uses have great scientific evidence. And we also have increased variability in, in, in effect, increased variability of, of, of the effect of products as we move across these settings. Our work in off-label prescribing led us to wonder do prescribers know, or how much do they know about the FDA approved indications of the drugs that they're prescribing? So how do you think that they do? You think most prescribers, so what we did was we surveyed prescribers about 20 drug indication dyads, inhaled corticosteroids for asthma, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors for depression, and we surveyed a nationally representative sample of psychiatrists and primary care physicians and asked them, one, have you used this drug for this indication for each of the 20 dyads? And two, is this drug approved by the FDA for this indication? I was really depressed at the end of my fellowship because I produced a study that showed that doctors and patients don't talk about costs. And my advisor at the time, my mentor told me, he said, Caleb, sometimes the best research proves the obvious. I suppose I felt slightly better, but I've got to say, and a lot of the work that I've done has, has been produced results that I think have, have sort of, I haven't been totally shocked by them, but I've got to say that still looking at the data that I'm about to show you, uh, that I find the results striking. Essentially, we found that prescribers did no better than a coin flip. Essentially, the average respondent correctly identified about half of the drug use pairs that we queried about. Now you might say, Caleb, it doesn't matter that doctors don't know the FDA label. They need to know the evidence, not the FDA label. The evidence may be totally different than the label. But look at some of the examples that we queried about. One fifth of doctors erroneously reported antipsychotics are labeled for dementia. One third erroneously reported benzodiazepines are labeled for chronic anxiety. These were doctors that said that they had used this drug 
for this indication within the previous 12 months. And at the time of the survey, not only were these drugs not approved for these indications, the FDA had a black box warning specifically cautioning prescribers not to use these drugs for this indication. What, what's going on there? So I think that these data and more data since then demonstrate what a vexing area of pharmaceutical regulation off-label use is, and it really demonstrates the complexities of trying to optimize therapies. Uh, now, one of my favorite lines is that all of us are smarter than any of us. And so my question for you is, where is the system breaking down here? Where do you want us to focus? You know, uh, you are king for a day, uh, queen for a day, uh, FDA commissioner for a day. Where should we be focusing at what points in approval or marketing, prescribing, dispensing, utilization or coverage are our best for us to focus on as we're trying to decrease the widespread use of products off-label for scientifically unsupported indications. Regulators also have to continuously manage emerging safety signals, and this is a big deal. And here I've depicted just some of these types of safety signals that we worry about. And indeed, many pharmacoepidemiologists spend their entire careers focused just on, on, on elucidating uh, these types of important findings that all too often are discovered only after large populations have been exposed. And we have been interested in not only examining the effect of specific regulatory communications, but also more broadly looking at the overall effect. And I'm a little worried I left the last question too quickly because I only saw the uh, number of chat entries increase from 18 to 20, and I see 108 of you on the Zoom. So um, I'd be delighted, and I'm still interested. Uh, we could spend the entire <laughs> remainder of the hour focused just on this question. It's such an important one. Uh, I am going to continue, but, um, but I do want to encourage you to uh, weigh in and, and share with us your thoughts about how we can do better here. Um, so regulators have to manage these safety signals and emerging concerns. And I share with you here a systematic review that we performed that characterized the effect of these risk communications. And what we found was that if you've seen one study, you've seen one study. In other words, some regulatory advisories have had large effects and other risk communications have had little to no effects. To be clear here, what I'm talking about is when the FDA promulgates a communication, disseminates a communication to either or both the general public and prescribers regarding a specific risk, such as, for example, the potential risk of suicidal ideation with antidepressants or thromboembolism blood clots with oral contraceptives. Our work also demonstrated that risk communications have the potential for unintended consequences. Decreases may occur non-selectively. Advisories may lead to abrupt discontinuations that do more harm than good. And the totality of this evidence really underscores the importance of clear and consistent and transparent information regarding risk communication. I'm gonna briefly turn to payers just with one uh, case study, one anecdote, which is to examine how Medicaid programs responded to an important new drug safety signal. And in this case, we're looking at rosiglitazone when both scientific studies and FDA regulatory communications uh, uh, disseminated information about the potential cardiovascular risks of this product. And when we examined whether or not Medicaid coverage policies changed in response to the safety signal, the answer is no. The vast majority didn't. Uh, a few made rosiglitazone harder to get, but a few actually made it easier to get, which undermined our confidence that any of these changes had much to do with the safety communication. And here we looked at the difference in utilization among states that didn't provide coverage in the blue and that did provide coverage in red and we looked at this as a function of when the safety communication occurred. The y-axis is zero to 15, and it represents the percent of all oral diabetes medicines that were accounted for by rosiglitazone. And look that although the safety communication leads to significant drops in rosiglitazone use, in states where it was covered, they never reached the levels 
that they do in states where they weren't covered. And so my question again is what's going on and why didn't states modify their policies? Now I've only provided one case study. I had a great uh, teacher as, an, as a resident, an attending physician, uh, that, that said, uh, when I shared one anecdote, I'll never forget, he said, Caleb, the plural of anecdote does not data make. So a little high and mighty, but fair enough, I've just provided one case study here. But take my word for it. We have looked at other examples, and as have others, and payers are not routinely, I repeat, they are not routinely incorporating safety information into their coverage and reimbursement policies. So again, let's light up the chat forum and, and or talk about this in the question and answer session. But my question for you is why wouldn't they be doing this? I mean, this is something that I still puzzle about uh, five or more years after having initially done this work. Why wouldn't payers better incorporate safety information into their coverage policy? They don't follow the news or they don't meet regularly enough? Do you think they just don't care? Uh, is it too much information or are they just not incentivized to? They're just sort of cruel and ruthless and, and, and just don't have the economic incentives. Can they not afford so or, or would, would such an effort collapse under its own weight because the technology required it would be just, we just don't have it in, in the 21st century. Maybe there are other reasons that I'm missing here. So again, I encourage you to weigh in and uh, look forward to some dialogue uh, towards the end of this talk about this matter. So my question was about mission control and, and sort of who's minding this door. And I'd like to suggest that the answer is all of us and none of us. We have a patchwork or a mosaic of institutions and organizations. They each have some role to play. There's some shared and overlying responsibility, but there is a lot of space and a lot of gaps in between. And it's only with those gaps that you can explain things like half of all antibiotics being used inappropriately, uh, three quarters of off-label use lacking good scientific support, and all of the other uh, tidbits of data that I've shared with you and that many of you may already be familiar with. I'd like to briefly come to opioids. Uh, Dean McKenzie mentioned it in the introduction, and, and we remain in the midst of just an incredible epidemic, and it is, has not gone away. Uh, in some places, it's as bad as it's ever been. And one of the important drivers, not the only one, but one of the important drivers of the epidemic has been the vast overuse of prescription opioids for the management of chronic non-cancer pain. Several years ago, the school undertook a relationship with the Clinton Foundation to address the opioid epidemic. And of course, since then, the Bloomberg American Health Initiative has infused enormous momentum and resources and energy into taking on the addiction and overdose epidemic. And I'd like to just highlight here the third principle that has guided our ongoing work with the Clinton Foundation. And I hope that it doesn't seem as counterintuitive as it might have at the beginning of my talk. Opioids are neither good nor bad. It's not just about the risks of opioids, it's also about their benefits or lack thereof. Turns out they're not terribly effective for chronic non-cancer pain. And there's been continuous innovation and not always as a source for good. Uh, we performed work looking at prescribers' knowledge of abuse deterrent formulations things like crush-proof OxyContin, and a full, uh, uh, almost a half, if I'm recalling correctly, uh, erroneously reported that abuse deterrent formulations were less addictive than their counterparts. These drugs are taken, uh, swallowed by mouth, generally as the most common route of non-medical use, and there's nothing about an abuse deterrent formulation that prevents a patient from developing opioid use disorder. So I hope you can see then the ways that pharmacoepidemiology and the principles that I've discussed are relevant in our efforts in combating the opioid epidemic. Well, we not only have an epidemic, we have a pandemic. And we are also hard at work generating fundamental new knowledge about the use and safety and effectiveness in therapeutics against COVID-19. Uh, we've been fortunate to be able to work with colleagues on the other side of the street 
uh, in, in the School of Medicine and to uh, leverage the PMAP platform, the Precision Medicine Analytics platform, the Johns Hopkins Crown uh, COVID registry, and already have some work out uh, examining, uh, for example, the impact of the use of chronic immunosuppressives on, um, uh, on 30 day mortality and mechanical ventilation and those sorts of outcomes, but much, much more work to follow. And a lot of it likely to be done in this national COVID cohort collaborative, a truly remarkable undertaking arising out of the NCATS and the National Institutes of Health. I just have two or three more slides. Uh, these are some areas where I think the field is looking forward. Uh, for those of you that are interested in any of these, again, I'm happy to engage during question and answer about these areas. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll just share them with you, but not expand further on each of them. And I love this quote, and this slide reminds me to remind myself and all of you, this is a human business. Uh, at the end of the day, we're talking about our, our, our loved ones, ourselves, our moms and dads, brothers, sisters, our, our patients. Uh, and while this hasn't been largely a clinical talk, there are, there are many principles of sound prescribing that can also save patients and clinicians alike lots of heartache. Things such as the wisdom in Oster's quote here, the idea of considering over-the-counter medicines and dietary supplements, the concept of uh, deprescribing, that is, uh, don't just focus on what medicines to start, uh, focus on opportunities to peel medicines back. Uh, remember the potential for drug-drug interactions. Uh, consider patient aids like pill boxes that can help patients to improve their adherence. So in closing, I'd just like to highlight again this juxtaposition between the promise of products on the one hand and their perils on the other, to remind you of this constantly transforming landscape of therapeutics, uh, to highlight the important role of stakeholders. Science has to lead the way, but our science will be much better if we consider the stakeholders that, that, that have skin in the game, frankly, and that are vested in the issues that I've covered. And uh, this last point as well is just that the current environment is, is optimal. Uh, my chair, David Celentano, the chair of EPI, has, has a great, great line about how people finally understand and care what epidemiologists do given the COVID pandemic. And I think the COVID pandemic and the opioid epidemic are but two of many applied examples where our efforts are urgently needed. So I just would like to close in thanking you, Dean McKenzie, uh, for this privilege. Uh, my faculty colleagues, uh, thank you again for the opportunity to work with you in, in, in such a collegial and, um, and, and intellectually uh, stimulating environment. Uh, trainees, uh, for all that you contribute. And for those of you that may be joining from outside of the institution, I hope that this talk has given you a better vantage point of just one very, very tiny sliver of what we do here and what our school is all about. So thank you again, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Great. Well, thanks so much, Caleb. Great talk. Um, I, I have to start with a bit of an apology. Um, we didn't realize that um, uh, with the setup we have, you ha when you type something, you have to, a question you have to, in the chat, you have to address it to all panelists and attendees. Um, so that, um, but once we figured that out, then the, the chat box uh, lit up. <laughs> um, so there are lots of questions, lots of comments. Let me see if I can um, uh, share a few with you uh, in the remaining time we have. But I, I have to start, well, I think it's a question from your mother. Is it Bridget? Alexander? Yeah, Bridget, uh, yeah. Welcome, Bridget. <laughs> and she asks a really good question. And she says, what about the patient as a stakeholder? Well, uh, thank you, Mom. Uh, you always keep me on my toes. Uh, and uh, it's a great point. And patients are a vital stakeholder in this effort. Um, my work has tended to focus on the role in particular of regulators and payers. And that's why in peeling back the onion, as I put it, I provided uh, empiric work that we've done examining these two stakeholders but there are many, many uh, academicians and scholars and, and, uh, and pharmacoepidemiologists that are focused on un better understanding and empowering patients. 
Uh, one, the final point I'll make about patients, and I might have made this when I was sharing those five examples of concrete questions that I faced in my own practice, is that over the decades we've moved to a, a model in general of shared decision making. And I look to my patients to help me navigate these questions. I don't want all of the responsibility resting on my shoulders. And frankly, I need that 37 year old woman to help me understand her feelings about whether or not starting a medicine for her chronic anxiety is the right thing to do. Or that 73 year old man who's not that ambulatory but, but has bad osteoporosis, I wanna know his perspective on whether or not a bisphosphonate is the right treatment or not. So um, thank you uh, for all that you uh, have provided, frankly, in, in making this possible uh, and for your great question. Yeah, fantastic question, really, really good. Okay, so here's um, one from Kenneth Shermock. It says, one of the difficulties in studying drug-drug interactions is that there is no standard regarding which ones matter. Most official compendia listed a dizzying array of potential interactions, many of which are commonly prescribed together in real practice with no or very rare adverse events. How did you and your team identify the serious drug-drug interactions? Yeah, it's a great question, Ken, and I should also just thank you for uh, your uh, fellowship and, 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 and collaboration over over the years since uh, my, my arriving at Johns Hopkins, but it's a great question. And, and one of the things that makes this so challenging as your question illustrates is that there are potentially innumerable drug-drug interactions that may occur between any two given products. So in the particular instance that I provided where we use nationally representative data and household interviews, we used a common drug compendia. Of course, that then predicates the value of our contribution on this drug compendia. But for those of you that may not be familiar, there are, um, there are licensed proprietary products that summarize drug potential drug-drug interactions. And that was a way, Ken, that we were able to sort of leapfrog over that initial step. Uh, but indeed, identifying drug-drug interactions in the first place is um, an unenviable task and, and one that's um, one that's really wide open for discovery when it comes to products that are recently approved and on the market. And a question from Shivan um, Bhardwaji. Uh, with the opioid abuse deterrent uh, formulations, uh, don't we see an I issue with the patents and intellectual property protection laws in the US? Yeah, well, it's a wonderful question, uh, Shivan, and I'm not sure I can address um, it fully, but let me just say that these abuse deterrent formulations five or 10 years ago were brought to market with great fanfare and a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, you can imagine the commercial incentives. I mean, the opioid market in the US is 10 or 12 billion with a B a year. And so you can imagine uh, the, 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 the incentive that manufacturers face to bring these products to market. In, in fact, just last week, we published a paper in the Annals of Internal Medicine where we looked at all opioid approvals over a 20 year period. And of the 48, 48 new drug applications that we examined, 47 were not for new moieties. In other words, the vast amount of opioids that have been approved in the past two decades have not been for new, new chemicals, not new molecules. They're simply new formulations, new ways of delivering medicines. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that in some cases these haven't been important innovations, but I do think one has to be cognizant of the way that it creates, has created an incentive for manufacturers to recoup their investments. And the specific clinical concern, again, regarding abuse deterrent formulations, is based on work that we and others have done. It turns out that prescribers, one, it underestimate the number of people whose primary route of non-medical use is swallowing the pill whole. And two, many prescribers believe that abuse deterrent formulations are safer uh, than their counterparts. And there's ongoing, I mean, there was an FDA advisory committee meeting about this matter as recently as like a month ago or something. So this is not uh, over. Um, so I'm sorry that I can't directly address your question, but I hope that some of the context that I've provided is helpful. Great. And here's one from Corey. Um, says that I wonder what proportion of off-label use is materially harmful to patients. A large proportion might beg the question. 
are current regulations penalties ineffective? And if the proportion is low, are regulations working as intended? Is some off-label use uh, accept, is accepted if not encouraged? Great, Corey. Well, I should just thank you, uh, firstly, for your question. And for those of you who may not know, Corey is one of our newest uh, doctoral uh, candidates in the Department of Epidemiology. And uh, it's the, the sort of the, the quality of your question, which demonstrates uh, why we're so fortunate to have trainees around here. Um, what I would say, Corey, is that, uh, you know, to answer this question, I would want to want to get more specific. In other words, these are questions that are highly important, but also hard to answer in the abstract. Um, a lot of off-label use, even scientifically unsupported off-label use, may not be materially harmful. And certainly some of it is not only not harmful, it's, 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 it's the best standards of care around. So I think, uh, you know, if you and I were talking one-on-one uh, -on -one and thinking about, well, how can we better sort of uh, dig down here, I'd want to think about specific instances where we could actually try to quantify this, maybe model this, maybe look at a select class and then be able to do the empiric work to answer this. But certainly it's, it's far less than the 75% that are scientifically unsupported that I would argue are, have important uh, uh, unequivocal material harms. On the other hand, millions of people are being harmed as I think the case of atypical antipsychotics demonstrates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a question from Sarah Tanbeer. Um, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Can you briefly discuss your thoughts on how increased prior authorization requirements for select medication can prevent harmful off-label use? Well, thank you, Sarah. And I'm mindful of the time, so maybe this is the last query. I, I always like to try to land planes on time, although you're, you're, you're in the captain's seat, uh, Dean McKenzie. But um, Sarah, it's a great question, and prior authorization is, is one of uh, several methods that are used by pharmacy benefits managers to try to promote safer use and indeed, you know, our finding that payers weren't necessarily re-tiering projects, I think begs the question and, and makes your question a very good one, which is, well, maybe they're not re-tiering them and, and changing their formularies in terms of moving something from first tier to third tier, but are they modifying their prior authorization policies in order to make these products uh, harder to get or more safely administered and the like? Again, I think this is a question where there's probably some empiric data and where there's certainly more room to go. Um, uh, uh, you know, working, working with payers has, uh, has tremendous opportunities, but also challenges as well. But I think it's a good question, and one shouldn't forget about the, the, the potential power of these, uh, these types of utilization management criteria, so, uh, or utilization management techniques, prior authorization, step therapy, and quantity limits being the big three. Sure, great. Well, I am mindful of the time. We're um, just, at, just about at the top of the hour. So it just gives me a, a moment to thank Caleb um, for all he is um, doing um, and all he will continue to do. We look forward to um, um, your pursuing um, all the good work that you are and make having an impact that you are. So thank you. And um, again, our apologies. Um, so, but our multimedia tech um, is Kevin. And I, first of all, I wanna thank him um, for making this possible. Um, and if, 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 Kevin, if you could just make a copy of the chat um, so that uh, Caleb has that. There's, some, uh, there's a lot of chat back and forth once we figured it out. Um, <laughs> that was my goal, that was what I wanted. So I exactly, do this Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and also some really good questions. Um, and I'm sure you'd like to see the questions and um, uh, you might even be able to get back to some of the folks who have reached out to ask questions, lots of good questions. So with that, um, let me thank you. Let me thank your mom, um, Bridget, um, for joining us and your wife, Martha. And if your kids are still on, if they- Oh, I hope not. <laughs> but Owen, Owen, Oliver, and Elliot, do I That's have that right. correct? That's right. Yeah. Um, you should be very proud of your dad. Um, so with that, um, thanks, everybody. Uh, stay well, be safe, and we'll see you soon. Take thank care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.